24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Hey everyone, it's Matt here, and this is One Minute for Mass. This weekend's Gospel has the Pharisees complaining about Jesus, specifically that he welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Who are they talking about, these sinners? Well, it would have been the tax collectors, the prostitutes, and anyone else who was generally looked down upon by the rest of the community. Jesus never let social protocol get in the way of his ministry. In fact, he sought out those that were outcast and excluded, and he made no apologies for it. He even openly challenged anyone who spoke against what he was doing. So if we're going to follow Jesus Christ today, well, we need to be asking ourselves, who are the outcasts and who are the excluded today? Are we willing to seek out people that we normally avoid and bring the love of the gospel to them rather than waiting for them to come to us? One thing's for sure, following Jesus is going to be a challenge and at times we're going to be called to put the needs of others in front of our own comforts. And this Sunday is as good a day as any to get started. And perhaps a good way to start would be a simple prayer such as this. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Please show me if there's someone you need me to love on your behalf today. I'll see you guys at Mass. Exodus chapter 32 verses 7 to 11 and 13 to 14. The Lord changed his mind on the punishment he had threatened to inflict on his people. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once to your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, for they have become depraved. They have soon turned aside from the way I pointed out to them, making for themselves a molten calf and worshipping it, sacrificing to it, and crying out, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I see how stiff-necked this people is, continued the Lord to Moses. Let me alone then, that my wrath may blaze up against them to consume them. Then I will make of you a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God, saying, Why, O Lord, should your wrath blaze up against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt? with such great power and with so strong a hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and all this land that I promised, I will give your descendants as their perpetual heritage. So the Lord relented in the punishment he had threatened to inflict on his people. The Word of the Lord Being a mediator is a tough job. At this time Moses is the mediator between God and man. Moses and God are having a meeting on the mountain when God who knows everything tells Moses what the Israelites are doing while he and God are having this conversation. In essence God tells him that they are breaking the first two commandments. If you have ever had the pleasure of raising children you know that busy hands are happy hands, and children's attention span is as long as 20 seconds. At this point the Israelites are Moses' children in faith who have not yet developed maturity in faith. The chosen people want to worship God, but they didn't know how. When people are frustrated and confused what do they do? They go back to what they have observed in the past and try to give it new meaning in the present and future. When in Egypt the Israelites watched Egyptian idol worship. Since God was the greatest value in the universe they made an idol out of gold, which to them, was the most valuable item they had. As my mother used to say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. They had forgotten about God's law, the only law that really matters for all eternity and the law that all other laws are based upon. In essence God says, remember what I did to the people of Noah's generation? Maybe it's time to begin again. Moses then attempts to mediate for the people by reminding God of his promises. Moses basically asks God to give him the honor of doing his job by bringing the people back to him. 
If you have ever wondered about the need for animal sacrifices consider this. The animals the Israelites subsequently sacrificed were the same animals that the Egyptians used for idol worship, the people also stayed in the desert long enough that the Egyptian ways they brought with them died out, Moses helped the people escape the wrath of the Lord but they didn't learn. Skipping ahead to Joshua 24 verses 15 and 16 we read, And if you be unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord, to serve other gods. As you continue to read the Bible you discover that when the Israelites fell into idol worship their enemies inflicted upon them God's justice, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive good or evil, according to what he has done in the body. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 and go to my Father. I will rise and go to my Father. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness, in the greatness of your compassion. Wipe out my offense Thoroughly wash me from my guilt And of my sin cleanse me I will rise and go to my Father A clean heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. Cast me not out from your presence, and your Holy Spirit take not from me. I will rise and go to my Father. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. My sacrifice, O God, is a contrite spirit. A heart contrite and humbled, O oh God, you will not spur. I will rise and go to my Father. Psalm 51 verses 3 to 4, 12 to 13, 17, and 19. I will rise and go to my Father. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness, in the greatness of your compassion wipe out my offense. Thoroughly wash me from my guilt and of my sin cleanse me. A clean heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. Cast me not out from your presence, and your Holy Spirit take not from me. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. My sacrifice, O God, is a contrite spirit, a heart contrite and humbled, O God, you will not spurn. King David's writing of this psalm was prompted by the Lord sending the prophet Nathan to David to get David to take responsibility for his sins of adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. Psalm 51 begins with three very important statements made by David. 51 verse 1 to 3 Have mercy on me O God, according to your merciful love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, 
and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. As these verses show, David a king, is humbling himself to the king of all kings, God, by admitting his sin, asking for forgiveness. He also expresses his confidence that because of God's merciful and abundant love, he will be forgiven. We should be comforted by the fact that David's sins were forgiven, which means that our sins too may also be forgiven if we have the courage to acknowledge them by having the willingness and humility to enter the confessional seeking God's forgiveness, and the willingness to try to change our ways. Nathan the prophet had confronted David with David's sin. David uses the psalm as a way not only to confess but more importantly to ask God's forgiveness. The message of the psalm is that the worse offender among God's people can appeal to God for forgiveness, moral renewal, and the resumption of a joyful life if the sinner comes to God with a broken spirit and bases his appeal on God's compassion, mercy and grace. Like the story of the prodigal son, God's arms are always open. Open to welcome you back into our Christian family. Why is seeking God's forgiveness vitally important? Revelation 21 verse 8 But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, as for murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot shall be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The second death is a reference to eternal damnation because nothing unclean will ever enter heaven. Isaiah 30 33 For a burning place has long been prepared, yes, for the king it is made ready, its pyre or heap of wood for burning a dead body is made deep and wide, with fire and wood in abundance, the breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. Confront the dark parts of yourself, and work to banish them with illumination and forgiveness. Your willingness to wrestle with your demons will cause your angels to sing. August Wilson First Timothy chapter 1 verses 12 to 17 Christ came to save sinners. Beloved, I am grateful to him who has strengthened me, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he considered me trustworthy in appointing me to the ministry. I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and arrogant, but I have been mercifully treated because I acted out of ignorance in my unbelief. Indeed, the grace of our Lord has been abundant, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of these, I am the foremost, but for that reason I was mercifully treated so that in me as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display all his patience as an example for those who would come to believe in him for everlasting life. To the King of ages, incorruptible, invisible, the only God, honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The Word of the Lord. In this reading there are four reasons that Paul is thanking Christ. First, Paul recognizes that Christ chose him to minister to the people. Paul was headed for destruction as a result of his persecution of the church. On the road to Damascus Christ has suddenly brought him to his senses and as a result he became a traveling preacher who focused his efforts around the Mediterranean Sea. Second, Paul is thanking Jesus because he trusted him enough to be of service to the church. Paul was always amazed that he, the leading persecutor of the church, had been chosen to now build up the church he had worked hard to destroy. Third, he thanked Jesus because he had appointed him to preach. Paul clearly understood that being appointed was not to be considered an honor, but he considered himself only as a hired hand or laborer in the Lord's field. Fourth, Jesus had empowered Paul to be his messenger or teacher of the scripture. Paul now a humble servant, would never boast of what he had done, but would credit his work to what Jesus had helped him do. Paul is telling his listeners that if, Christ can turn him into a follower he can change anyone into a follower if only they are willing to repent of their past sins. Your sin is not greater than God's mercy. Numani Ali Khan. Have you, 
like Paul, told others how God's mercy has had a positive influence in your life. Chapter 15 verses 1 to 32, there will be great joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus, but the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them he addressed this parable. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy, and upon his arrival home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having ten coins and losing one, would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, there will be rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 15 tells three separate parables, but they all have the same fundamental meaning. The Son of God has come to save those who are lost and celebrate those who were lost but now are found. In verses 1 to 7 we are told the story of the lost sheep. The Pharisees and scribes complain that Jesus speaks to and eats with tax collectors and sinners. Jews of the time hated tax collectors because they were viewed as turncoats, and they were Jews who were collecting tax money from their fellow Jews to support the pagan Roman Empire, their oppressors. Because of their religious arrogance they didn't view themselves as sinners and wanted to maintain their distance from those whom they considered less than themselves was their real complaint that Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners or was it that Pharisees themselves hadn't received an invitation from the tax collectors and sinners? In any event the Pharisees' arrogance would have forced them to refuse the invitation. The word Pharisee means, separated ones. Jesus came to save the lost but the Pharisees themselves didn't think they need help finding the path to salvation, they considered themselves as the ones blazing the trail, they thought, after all we are Jews by birth therefore we must be assured of salvation. They failed to recognize that in the eyes of a perfect and just God, all people are his creations and thus all are equal. To give advantages to one group would be unfair, thus imperfection, which is not possible with a perfect God. Their arrogance blinded them to the truth. The woman who had lost one of her coins did everything she could do to find and return it to the others didn't she? The final parable in this chapter is about people who have left the church or the son or daughter who have left the family to follow their own star, but consider how happy and welcoming we are when they return. Jesus doesn't want to lose any of us, consequently he does everything to grant us the grace to return to the flock, but we need to accept the invitation. There is joy in heaven is over the lost sheep, the lost son, the lost coin that has been returned. Don't we all join those in heaven rejoicing when the lost among us have been found? 
Joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners, for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him, and he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends, but as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. 
And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Compassion, Compassion and the Gift of Welcoming In Luke chapter 15 verses 11 through 32 we hear of the loving father who longs for the return of his lost son. There are now and always have been parents who sometimes feel that they are guilty because their children no longer attend church nor lead a Christian life. Our children come of age and become responsible for themselves and make their own decisions. Like the father of the prodigal son we should do all that we can to welcome them back to the faith when they decide it is time to return. The elder brother would have turned his back on the younger and sent him away but the father showed compassion to both of them. To the elder son for not showing forgiveness and to the younger son for his repentance. A nurse took the tired, anxious serviceman to the bedside of a dying man. Your son is here, she said to the old man. She had to repeat the word several times before the patient's eyes opened. Heavily sedated because of the pain of his heart attack, he dimly saw the young uniformed Marine standing outside the oxygen tent. He reached out his hand. The Marine wrapped his toughened fingers around the old man's hand, squeezing a message of love and encouragement. The nurse brought a chair so that the Marine could sit beside the bed. All through the night the young Marine sat there in the poorly lighted ward, holding the old man's hand and offering him words of love and strength. Occasionally, the nurse suggested that the Marine move away and rest a while. He refused. Whenever the nurse came into the ward, the Marine was oblivious of her and of the night noises of the hospital. The clanking of the oxygen tank, the laughter of the night staff members exchanging greetings, the cries and moans of the other patients. Now and then she heard him say a few gentle words. The dying man said nothing, only held tightly to his son all through the night. Along towards dawn, the old man died. The Marine released the now lifeless hand he had been holding and went to tell the nurse. While she did what she had to do, he waited. Finally, she returned. She started to offer words of sympathy, but the Marine interrupted her. Who was that man? He asked. The nurse was startled. He was your father, she answered. No, he wasn't. The Marine replied. I never saw him before in my life. Then why didn't you say something when I took you to him? I knew right away there had been a mistake, but I also knew he needed his son, and his son just wasn't here. Then I realized that he was too sick to tell whether or not I was his son, knowing how much he needed me, I stayed. I came here tonight to find a Mr. William Gray. His son was killed in Iraq today, and I was sent to inform him. What was this gentleman's name? The nurse with tears in her eyes answered, Mr. William Gray. Our Marine had the compassion of the father in today's reading. No matter what his son had done he put aside all guilt, anger, frustration, and disappointment to welcome his lost son back to the fold. Our Marine was the hand of God holding on to a man he didn't know, who was on his way home to the father. We are not human beings going through a temporary spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings going through a temporary human experience. Who will you show God's compassion to today? Good morning. Okay. Where does it say this? He says the son, the younger son collected all the money and where he went to a distant country, squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. Then the other son comes back and says, this son of yours swallowed up your property with prostitutes. 
You know what that is? You do. I'll see you later. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> sure, she goes, oh. Whoa. The idea, of course, every one of the readings today deal with forgiveness. The aspect of forgiveness and how it's very important and how, what an impact it has on us. And when, it's got, when it comes to God's forgiveness, it has a major impact and should change our way of life, should change us in the way we think and the way we act. We have God's forgiveness in here, in our relationship with Christ. We know that God has forgiven us of our sins and of our failures, and we try to walk with him. That's our call. That's our, our, our promise, our baptismal promise, to recognize that, yes, we have been forgiven. Do we have anybody here that's not a sinner? <laughs> but I know you're not going to hang in there, Dan. <laughs> but that's, that's good. You all know where you're at, because we all are here as, as sinners. We are here recognizing God's mercy. We hear in the first reading today, and we hear it even in the Old Testament, God's mercy is very prevalent in the Old Testament. It's ironic, though, because the Old Testament is written with that aspect, many ways, about how it's written in the sense that the writer always sort of tries to push himself up. I've mentioned this about the Gospel of John at times. How the Gospel of John always looks at it and says, the good, the, the one that, Je the disciple that Jesus loved. Well, we all know who that is, John. And he writes all of, the, all of that in, in, in his gospel. We have, uh, the uh, Genesis is, is attributed to Moses and, 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 in, and whoever, whether it was Moses or someone who has followed him, uh, and he writes the aspect of, of, of how good Moses was to his people, uh, to the people that, that followed him, that, that he led out of, out of, uh, Egypt. We hear the story today about how Moses led the people with, with the help of God, and God does, has effects to, on, on their lives tremendously. He, you know, after all of these plagues and all of the, the things that occurred in Egypt and how he, he led them through the desert and how he led them through the, the, the Red Sea, opened the Red Sea, and then had the Red Sea come and destroy Pharaoh's army. And then these people are given the, the gifts from God in and, and such a way. And then, while Moses is speaking to God on the mountain, these people create a gold calf. What were they thinking? I often thought about this numerous times, and I'm sure many of you have. What on earth, after all of these things, didn't they realize what God has, was doing for them? But the message is, of course... You have to realize that these people knew nothing else. They grew up in, pagan, in a pagan society where that's how they expressed their relationship with God. And we know that. And we hear Moses speak to God, and of course it's in Moses' words. God says, I'm going to destroy them because they've, they've turned away from him. And Moses says, no, you wouldn't do that because you love them. You brought them. You gave them all of these things. You led them out of, e out of Egypt. You have, you have shown your power to them. You have shown your mercy to them. You would continue. Well, these are attributed to Moses' words, but really they are God's words. This is how God reacted, how God responded to them. And this is how humanity understands them. And we see the the mercy of God here, how he took care of his people. <coughs> Excuse me. So we hear this, this understanding of the mercy of God and how it affected the Israelite community. We hear in the second reading, Paul talk about how his relationship with Christ, how it was different, how he was a great sinner. And Christ turned it around. God turned it around and changed his life, made him different. It's exactly what every single one of us share. You've heard this story, this, these parables before, I'm sure, right? Parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the... the well, Jesus looks at the Pharisees 
And he sees how they look at him, and they say, well, he's eating and, and cavorting with sinners. Who of us hasn't done that? Right? We are all sinners. I don't answer that so quickly, sir. Okay. <laughs> the, so we have, we, have, we have an understanding that, yes, every single one of us needs God's forgiveness. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we have here is that Jesus turns to, to the disciples and tells this parable. The parable that emphasizes God's mercy. And so he tells the story about how the, uh, which who of you, who have a hundred sheep, would go out and look for one who's lost, so that the 99 remain back. He tells them, I come for the sinners. And those of you who think that you are not a sinner, are so good that you don't need this mercy, that's the saddest part. Many of us have to look at ourselves and say, where we find the greatest gift from God is when we realize that we need God's forgiveness. We need God's, God's strength. Even writers throughout ages have always written about the great forgiveness that changed people's lives. How we look upon how God has touched us and it should change our lives. I'm reminded about a couple of weeks ago, of course, we see in the news all the time, we see about how somebody is shot and, and one day or one, one effect. A couple of weeks ago, we had a woman on the, interviewing a woman whose son had shot another kid. And she stu stood there and they, she, she was crying and weeping. And she says, I feel so sorry for the child that has died. But she says, then she looks at it and she says, but and I feel sorry for my son. He's my son. That understanding of God's love, God's compassion, God's forgiveness when it comes to his own children, that's what we have to be reminded of. The aspect of forgiveness is so strong with the Lord. His love is so strong for each and every one of us that we have to hold on to that understanding, that love is centered on, our, on his forgiveness for us. And he's come for us so that we may understand that and that our lives may be different because of it. When we don't need, when we don't feel that we need forgiveness, that's, that's, the, that's the real trouble. When we think that we're so good that we, we don't need the Lord's, Lord's care and his love, that's the way when we start pushing the Lord away. That's what this gospel is about. Well, this gospel talks about the prodigal son. And I particularly like the way aspect of the prodigal son in the sense that this young man thinks that he can do it all on his own. This is what he comes to God for, or comes to his father for. He says, Father, give me your money that I'm going to get, and I'm going to handle I don't need you. I don't need you. And so he finds out when he, uh, he's really turned himself away from, from the Lord. And of course, that's what I always say. That's where we, we, we understand how many times have many of us have grown up with the idea that, yes, we should love the Lord. God has given us free will to either accept him or not accept him. And when we accept him, we find great love and we, we see his love and his power and his strength. But when we don't accept him, what is he, what we, we are taught in many ways, we are taught, we've been taught throughout the ages that he, we're going to get punished. Is that right? We're going to get punished. Well, we do it to ourselves. God doesn't punish us. God allows us to choose no, say the no to God. And when we say no to God, we're like that son who comes to his father and says, I want all my money, I'm going to take care of this on my own. And we're so much like that son because what do we do? We find ourselves in trouble. We find ourselves lacking the things that we need, the lacking the, the ability to really fulfill God's mercy and his love in our own lives. And we realize, this son realizes, I've made a mistake. And he goes to ask for forgiveness from his father. He, that's, that's the biggest point of this, this parable. The son recognizes that he needs his father. And the, and the father comes up and says, yes, I've been waiting for you. Just like that mother who cries, you are my son. It's the emphasis to emphasize how we, 
recognize in forgiveness God's presence. Now, the son could have stayed there and waddled, waddled in, the, uh, in the pigsty and remained there for the rest of his life, which many people do. But we are reminded that when we come to forgiveness, God's arms are always open to us. And that's what we are called to change our lives. This gospel should t- 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 it tells us to look in on ourselves and to see where we have, have this forgiveness that God has for us, where it, it's not a, making an effect in our lives. Do we see the love of God in our lives so strongly that it makes us different people, makes us want to follow Christ, makes us want to think of him rather than the things of our, that are of ourselves. This is where we are. This is what this gospel opens us to be. Why do Catholics confess their sins to a priest rather than going directly to God? Well, the quick answer is because that's the way God wants us to do it. In James chapter 5, verse 16, God, through the sacred scriptures, commands us to confess our sins to one another. Notice, scripture does not say confess your sins straight to God and only to God. It says, confess your sins to one another. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 6, Jesus tells us that he was given authority on earth to forgive sins. And then scripture proceeds to tell us in verse 8 that this authority was given to men, plural. In John 20, verses 21 through 23, What is the first thing Jesus says to the gathered disciples on the night of his resurrection? Jesus says to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. How did the Father send Jesus? Well, we just saw in Matthew 9 that the Father sent Jesus with the authority on earth to forgive sins. Now Jesus sends out his disciples as the Father has sent him. So what authority must Jesus be sending his disciples out with? The authority on earth to forgive sins. And just in case they didn't get it, verses 22 and 23 says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Why would Jesus give the apostles the power to forgive or retain sins if he wasn't expecting folks to confess their sins to them? And how could they forgive or retain sins if no one was confessing their sins to them? The Bible tells us to confess our sins to one another. It also tells us that God gave men the authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus sends out his disciples with the authority on earth to forgive sins. When Catholics confess their sins to a priest, we are simply following the plan laid down by Jesus Christ. He forgives sins through the priest. It is God's power. But he exercises that power through the ministry of the priest. In the second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 18, St. Paul tells us, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Catholics confess their sins to a priest rather than going directly to God because that's what Scripture asks us to do.
This is a homily for the 24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 to 32. The first reading for this Sunday's Mass comes from the book of Exodus. Exodus is a Greek word. It means literally the way out. So the book of Exodus tells the great story of liberation from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. And the great leader of this epic journey of liberation is Moses. When the people reach Mount Sinai, Moses goes up the mountain and there he receives from God the Torah, the tablets of the law. But as we heard in today's first reading from chapter 32 of the book of Exodus, God then says to Moses, Go down now, because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have apostatized. They have been quick to leave the way I marked out for them. They have made themselves a calf of molten metal and have worshipped it and offered it sacrifice. Here is your God Israel, they have cried, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now what is happening here? Have the people turned their back on Yahweh, the God of Israel, and worshipped another God, a God fashioned in the image of a calf and made of molten metal? Pope Benedict offers us an interesting insight into the meaning of this episode. He argues that the people of Israel haven't turned their back on Yahweh to worship another God, but they have attempted to bring Yahweh down into their own world. He says this, The people cannot cope with the invisible, remote and mysterious God. They want to bring him down into their own world, into what they can see and understand. And this remains a perennial temptation for all of us. God is transcendent, totally other. But we continually try to whittle God down to size, to a size our human minds can apprehend. It's a process that I call decantering the divine into diminished dimensions. Or, to put it another way, we try to domesticate God, to put God on a leash, to make him a household pet who does our bidding. Well, let's now turn to today's Gospel. We meet the Pharisees again in this Gospel, and Jesus tells three stories in response to a complaint by the Pharisees and the scribes. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. What they have done is to reduce the transcendent God into someone like themselves. They've tried to create God in their own image, a God who has their own narrow understanding of the Torah, a God who agrees with their own rigid criteria of who is and who is not acceptable. So by way of response, Jesus tells three stories. Each of these stories is about something or someone being lost. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost sons. So what's happening here? Last Sunday, Jesus said, Anyone who does not carry his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now keep in mind that a cross is made up of two intersecting beams, one vertical and the other horizontal. It's a symbol of decision making. In fact, we often say at crucial moments in our life, I have come to the crossroads, a moment of crisis, of decision. At the crossroads, we make a choice to live a life that is liberating, life-giving, loving, 
and faithful to who I am, faithful to the person God has created me to become. But what happens if at the crossroads we take the wrong turn? Well, this is what happens. God sends out the search party to find the one who is lost. And so today, stories about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and two lost sons. Let me focus on the third of those stories, a parable about a father and his two sons, a parable that's found only in Luke's Gospel. And how should we name this story? Well, I think the parable is best known as the parable of the prodigal son. But is that really a good title? If a title should really name the critical point of the story. Now, the word prodigal means wastefully extravagant. Now, while the young son's prodigality is an important element in the plot, it's not really the heart of the story. Sometimes this story is called the parable of the prodigal father, the father who himself is wastefully extravagant in the love that he lavishes on both of his sons. Perhaps the parable of the merciful father, the father who is prepared to welcome back the younger son unconditionally, the very son who has turned his back on his family and squandered his inheritance. I would argue that the most appropriate title is The Father and His Two Lost Sons. Yes, two lost sons, because each of his sons is lost, but each of them in a different way. Let's consider the younger of the two sons first. We're told that he says to his father, let me have the share of the estate that would come to me. A request unthinkable at that time and in that culture. But he takes the money, that's his, he goes to a distant country, and we're told he squanders his money on a life of debauchery. Where does that leave his father? In a culture where awareness of honour and shame are so deeply ingrained, the father has been publicly shamed. His land has been split in two, with the younger boy selling off his share to someone else. And the boy's impertinence in asking for his share before his father had died, it was the equivalent of saying, I wish you were dead. And in going off to a distant land, He's abandoned his obligation to care for his father in his old age. Now things don't go well for the younger son. We're told that he squanders all of his money on a life of debauchery. And when it's all spent, that country experiences a severe famine. Now we can presume that once he's squandered his money, his friends all abandon him and he's left with only one option, to hire himself out to one of the local businessmen, who puts him on his farm to feed the pigs. Now it's quite likely that a 21st century audience, living in the Western world, wouldn't register just how abhorrent and shameful that would have sounded to a 1st century Palestinian Jew a young Jewish boy working with pigs, unclean animals, and even being prepared to eat the husks the pigs were eating. Even contemporary Jews would find this offensive. A number of years ago, the Sydney Morning Herald carried an article about Israel's largest importer of quality wooden toys. The company had imported wooden farmyard sets from Toys R Us, complete with farm buildings and animals. But to avoid offending Orthodox Jews, the article says 
that the importer removed the three little carved pigs from each of the playsets and replaced them with three geese. When one customer complained, the owner explained, How can you let children play with those pigs? It's a bad influence, and it's just not right. To many people in Israel, it is not right to play with unholy animals. The image of the pig is a very powerful one in Jewish history, and it's an offensive image. From the point of view of storytelling, having this boy working with pigs is a way of saying that he's alienated himself from his religious tradition, his culture, his family. So in this distant land, he begins to think of returning home. He realises that he can no longer return home as a son. So he rehearses in his own mind a scenario in which he returns to his father, offering to work on the farm as a paid servant. So he leaves this distant land to begin the long journey home. The Hebrew word for repentance is shuv, which means to return. The younger son was alienated from his true self, and now he wishes to return. Repentance is coming home. The father had never given up hope of seeing his son again, and when he sees him in the distance, he can't believe his eyes. We're told that he ran to the boy, clasped him in his arms, and kissed him tenderly. Biblical scholar Bishop Tom Wright suggests that we could call this parable the parable of the running father because he explains that in a culture where senior figures are far too dignified to run anywhere, this man takes to his heels as soon as he sees his young son dragging himself home. Such is the love of God our Father. The father puts a ring on his son's finger and sandals on his feet, symbols that he's been received home not as a servant but as a son. Now the story could have finished there, and it would have been a beautiful story of love, compassion and forgiveness. But the story doesn't stop there. We now have the episode with the older brother. We're told the older brother was in the fields, and as he drew near the house, he could hear music and dancing. He asks one of the servants what it's all about. Your brother has come home, the servant replied, and your father has killed the calf we had fattened, because he's got him back safe and sound. We're then told he was angry then, and refuse to go in. But his father comes out to plead with him to come in and join the festivities. Whether or not he does go inside, we never find out. This older son, like his younger brother, is also lost, but in a different kind of way. Who is this older brother. He's someone like the Pharisees, with their very narrow and judgmental image of God, the kind of God they want to whittle down to size, to domesticate, the kind of God who has to play according to their rules. Jesus reveals a running God, a God who seeks out the lost, who seeks out the sinner, and welcomes the outsider and invites them to come home. The readings for this Sunday are beautiful. They express the love and mercy of God, how He seeks us out, how He saves us from our sin and cares for us throughout our life. 
Um, in the readings we have the Israelites in the desert in the first reading really encounter their shallowness of heart, how quickly they leave the Lord and, and go to worship a molten calf. We hear in the second reading, St. Paul, St. Paul of all people, expressing how he was a sinner. Of, he, he's the first of all sinners, but God saved him from that. God's looked with mercy upon him. But in the gospel, we really see it deeply with the three parables that Christ shares. Now, if your parish reads the short version, you still get the richness of God's generous love. We hear Christ give the analogy or the parable of the shepherd who leaves the 99 to search for the one. And we also hear the parable of the person who loses one gold piece and searches. It says they light a lamp, which means it got dark. They search through the night for this gold coin. That's how precious we are to the Lord, how much he'll reach for us, seek us out, bring us to conversion from our sin, from our darkness, from our bondage and sin. And he desires to bring us to repentance, conversion of life. Now, when I think of repentance, conversion of life, and how God concretely reaches to us, I think immediately of the beautiful gift we have in the Catholic Church, which is the sacrament of reconciliation. I remember a specific confession I had with the founder of our SALT community, Father James Flanagan. I was young in formation, and I was still really relying on myself, trying to grow in virtue. And it's beautiful to strengthen our will. But I really had this sense of everything was in my control and relied on me. Now, I was in confession with Father Flanagan, and one of the things he recommended to me was to pray nightly, every single day, a litany of gratitude, or what he called a litany of thanksgiving, listing the things that I'm grateful for, the gifts and blessings and the ways that God reached to me, provided for me, extended his grace. That practice has really transformed the spirit with which I live virtue, I desire for God. It was such a beautiful way to remind myself not to think of my own sin, but to think of the Father of mercies, who leaves the 99, who searches for you, his precious gold coin, and who runs out to meet the prodigal son, that heart of the Father who seeks for us. Let's remember this week that it's always God who reaches first for us. He provides the grace. He welcomes us back. I encourage you to avail yourself of the sacrament of reconciliation this week and have a beautiful week. God bless you. Forgiving Ourselves John Plummer lives the quiet life of a Methodist pastor in a sleepy Virginia town, but things weren't always that way. As a helicopter pilot during the Vietnam War, he helped organize a napalm raid on the village of Trang Bang in 1972. A bombing immortalized by a prize-winning photograph of one of its victims. For the next 24 years, John was haunted by the photograph. An image that for many people captured the essence of the war. A naked and burned nine-year-old running toward the camera with plumes of black smoke billowing in the sky behind her. For 24 years, John's conscience was tormented. He wanted to find the little girl to tell her that he was sorry, but he could not. Turning in on himself, he grew more and more depressed and he began to drink. Then. In an almost unbelievable coincidence, John met Kim during an event at the Vietnam War Memorial on Veterans Day, 1996. Kim had come to Washington, D.C. to lay a wreath at the monument. John had come to D.C. with a group of former pilots unable to come to terms with their shared past, but they were determined to stick together anyway. In a speech to the crowd, Kim introduced herself as the girl in the famous photograph. She still suffers from her burns, she said, but she was not bitter, and she wanted people to know that others had suffered even more than she had. Behind that picture of me, thousands and thousands of people died. They lost parts of their bodies. Their whole lives were destroyed, and nobody took their picture. Kim went on to say that although she could not change the past, she had forgiven the men who had bombed her village, and that she felt a calling to promote peace by fostering goodwill between America and Vietnam. John, beside himself, pushed through the crowds and managed to catch her attention before she was whisked away by a police escort. 
He identified himself as a former pilot in Vietnam and said that he felt responsible for the bombing of her village 24 years before. He says, Kim saw my grief, my pain, my sorrow. She held out her arms to me and embraced me. All I could say was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, over and over again. And at that same time, she was saying, it's all right, I forgive you. John says that it was vital for him to meet face to face with Kim and to tell her that he had agonized for years over her injuries without having had the chance to get that off his chest. He is not sure that he could have ever forgiven himself. As it turned out, of course, he got even more than he had hoped for. Kim forgave him. Reflecting on the way the incident changed his life, John maintains that forgiveness is neither earned nor even deserved, but a gift. It is also a mystery. He still can't quite grasp how a short conversation could wipe away a 24-year nightmare. Matthew chapter 6 verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father also will forgive you. Kim had forgiven John and those who helped in the attack many years ago. Now John was able to forgive himself. For he that cannot forgive others breaks the bridge over which he must pass himself. For every man has need to be forgiven. Thomas Fuller You can't undo anything you've already done, but you can face up to it. You can tell the truth. You can seek forgiveness and let God do the rest unknown. We achieve inner health only through forgiveness. The forgiveness not only of others, but also of ourselves. Joshua Lott Leibman It's toughest to forgive ourselves, so it is probably best to start with other people. It's almost like peeling an onion. Layer by layer, forgiving others, you really do get to the point where you can forgive yourself. Patty Duke